Thank you everybody for joining us this morning as we open the workshop. Our first set of opening remarks will be given by General Schwartz, U.S. Air Force retired, who serves as president of the Institute for Defense Analyses, one of the four organizations involved in hosting DataWorks this year. At IDA, we answer challenging U.S. security and science policy questions with objective analysis, leveraging scientific, technical, and analytical expertise. General Schwartz directs the activities of more than 1,000 researchers employed, employed by IDA. He has a long and prestigious career of service and leadership that spans over five decades. Prior to retiring from the U.S. Air Force, General Schwartz served as the 19th Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force. So thank you, General Schwartz, for giving us the opening remarks. Thank, thank you, Rebecca. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to all of our attendees. This is the sixth year of DataWorks. The event is the result of a, an enormously successful collaboration between IDA, dot &E, NASA, and the American Statistical Association section on statistics in defense and national security. Please allow me to offer special recognition to the acting director, Dr. Raymond uh, O'Toole from OTNE, uh, Dr. Greg Zacharias, uh, Chief Scientist at DOTNE, and Mr. Alan Kilgore, Director, Research Directorate at the NASA Langley Research Center. Thank you all for your great support of this forum. In addition, we have uh, among us a number of executive branch agencies, both military and civilian, including CAPE, the service test agencies, DHS, and the national labs. A little over a year ago, the pandemic forced us to enter territory none of us expected. Despite the abrupt, profound changes to our daily lives, all of you continue to produce your best work to support evaluations for defense and aerospace systems. We are proud to feature many of your research efforts from this past year in this workshop. Our goal for this workshop is to foster collaborations, share knowledge, advance methods, and continue to improve the capabilities of this essential workforce. IDA continues to promote statistical thinking through collaborations with the academic community. We look forward to continuing to strengthen our relationship with our academic partners, including Virginia Tech, which will soon be our next door neighbor, and the Science of Test Research Consortium. DataWorks is a great foundation on which to strengthen collaboration generally, and certainly among national security organizations, including dot &E, NASA, and CAPE. For example, IDA is encouraging a connection between CAPE and dot &E. CAPE is now hosting dot &E reports, making report distribution more accessible and more impactful. Ideally, test outcomes should directly affect CAPE's evaluations of future force structure and programs. The work of future force planners should be grounded in real world system performance offered by the test and evaluation community. New threats to our systems will continue to emerge, putting pressure on the TNE community to include these emerging challenges in realistic scenarios. Our warfighters also need emerging technology at the speed of relevance, which calls for faster and more broadly scoped test and evaluation. Statistical methods developed and disseminated at DataWorks support t and &E of emerging technology and domains to include topics covered in this year's program, AI, autonomous systems, and of course, cybersecurity. As you all know, cybersecurity is vitally important to ensuring the effectiveness, suitability, survivability, and lethality of weapon systems. The, ex 
the exploration of innovative analytical methodologies and the development of new metrics for evaluating system cybersecurity posture are increasingly essential components of this community's activities. As artificial intelligence assumes tasks traditionally performed by humans or to power systems that act autonomously, testers will need to evaluate human system interaction to establish the trustworthiness of a system. IDA is working with dot &E, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, and DARPA to develop protocols and evaluation methods for such trustworthiness testing. Finally, data from tests is typically costly to obtain, and we must treat each and such data as a valuable resource. Well-managed data enables scientific best practices, produces research techniques and analyses which are inherently objective and yes, defensible. IDA is developing streamlined processes to enable accessibility and distribution, incorporating procedures, which also accords due deference due deference to data ethics considerations. Our system performance database will help researchers combine and reuse evaluation outcomes for novel analyses. IDA is eager to share our experiences with this community, a topic of one of our DataWorks roundtable sessions. Data management and reproducibility are key themes for this year's workshop. I anticipate that this in these two areas where DataWorks community will most dramatically advance the art and science of test. Please allow me now to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ray O'Toole. Since January, Dr. Ray O'Toole served as the Acting Director, Operational Test and Evaluation. He was appointed the Principal Deputy Director of Operational Test and Evaluation in February 2020. He participates in the formulation, development, advocacy, and oversight of policies of the Secretary of Defense and in the development and implementation of test and test resource programs. He supports the director in planning, conduct, evaluation, and reporting of operational and live fire testing. Prior to his appointment as principal deputy director, Dr. O'Toole served as the deputy director for naval warfare within dot &E. In addition, Dr. O'Toole has over 30 years of experience as a Naval officer, including five commanding officer tours. Dr. O'Toole, over to you, sir. Thank you, General Schwartz, for that very kind uh, remarks and, and great introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. First, I'd like to thank um, General Schwartz, Bob Soul, Rebecca Medlin, and the entire IDA team for managing the logistics of this year's workshop. Over the last year, we've become accustomed to holding large gatherings virtually, but it's still no easy feat. So as we say in the Navy, bravo Zulu to IDA for bringing us together. I'm very impressed by the diversity among this year's attendees. DataWorks is about sharing ideas to improve tests and analysis. We get the most out of dialogue when we tap a broad experience and knowledge base. Without question, we have that for this workshop. One of our co-organizers, NASA, lives on and often creates technologies cutting edge. DOD and NASA share the same tremendous pressure when it comes to T&E. Theirs might even be a little more intense than ours as they are more in the public eye. So I'm really glad NASA is here once again. I also very much appreciate DOD's test community for taking time to participate. All of the operational test agencies are here. Air Force Operational Test and Evaluation Center, also known as APATEC, Army Test and Evaluation Command, also known as ATEC, 
Marine Corps Operational Test and Evaluation Activity, also known as MACATIA, and Navy Operational Test and Evaluation Force, also known as CADAF, and, and the uh, Joint Interoperability Test Command, also known as JIDIC. And you might hear those acronyms later on throughout the presentations, which is why I uh, wanted to bring those out, as well as our OSD partners from Research and Engineering. We spend a fair amount of time together day to day, but getting away from the regular grind to brainstorm an open forum is helpful and always welcome. I'm happy to see folks from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, multiple national labs, and our federally funded research and development centers as well. Of course, I cannot forget the American Statist Statistical Association's contribution, especially as my daughter is a member. No offense to my government teammates, but I'm most excited by the number of non-government people who are here today. We have academics and students from across the world, including the United States, Ethiopia, France, India, and Israel. We have large corporations well known within the defense sector, such as Lockheed Martin, Boeing, LMI, and Collins Aerospace, and others that might surprise some of you, such as Anthology, Giant Eagle, and Edgewell Personal Care. And there are quite a few small businesses in the virtual room too, who I hope will bring a much needed fresh eye to solving our challenges. For those not familiar with dot and &E, in a nutshell, we're DOD's independent, unbiased oversight organization for operational and live fire test and evaluation. We determine whether an operational or live fire test is adequate that is, does it reflect real world conditions and employment scenarios, and whether the system tested is operationally effective, suitable, and survivable. We assess every type of system used in DOD from tanks to combat aircraft, to ships, to missiles, to communication equipment, to even business and health records management IT. And we provide our findings to the Congress, the Secretary, Deputy Secretary of Defense, the defense acquisition executive and the services. The problem we face in big picture terms is this. The technologies and systems DOD is pursuing are increasingly complex and in some cases push the limits of known science. Simultaneously, our adversaries are developing many complex systems that will place them on a peer level with us or catapult them past us. And perhaps they're not, they're doing so without the ethical boundaries that we follow. The test community must be able to assess whatever technologies the US is developing in environments and scenarios that accurately represent the adversarial systems, tactics, techniques, and procedures we'll face. So how will we keep doing our job given these parameters? Earlier this year, dot &E laid out an s and strategy that provides a basic framework for keeping t &E on pace with technology development. There are five focus areas. I wanna take a moment to run through them quickly. The first is software and cybersecurity t and &E. As I'm sure everyone in this forum knows, the vast majority of DOD systems are extremely software intense. A great example is the F-35. It's incredibly complicated code with wings and an engine attached. The quality of a system software and a system's overall cybersecurity often are the factors that determine operational effectiveness and survivability and sometimes lethality. What does this mean for t and &E? We know that people-centric solutions won't scale. Instead, we need automated solutions for both testing and continuous monitoring of system cybersecurity and software. We also need more and better red teaming and better cyber threat emulation. The second focus area is next generation t and &E capabilities. The quality of t and &E, and ultimately warfighting capability depends on the quality of the t and &E tools, infrastructure and processes we use. That includes how we collect, analyze and share data. t and &E must be able to handle whatever technologies are presented to us such as artificial intelligence and autonomous systems, space-based systems, directed energy, and hypersonics. And it must mirror real-world environments and scenarios in order to be thorough, 
operationally representative and credible. Then we have to glean the right data and make good use of those data in a timely manner. My opinion is DOD's T&E capabilities are not where they need to be, especially for the technologies coming down the pike. The third focus area is instituting an integrated T&E life cycle. I believe DOD can make T&E more effective and likely more efficient by dismantling the traditional contractor developmental and operational test silos. We need to replace that segregated sequential approach with a process that integrates CT, DT, and OT within a mission construct whenever possible. In practical terms, that means designing test events to collect data that satisfies both DT and OT needs. We also must involve the intended users and testers in developing system specs and contract requirements to ensure that they're operationally relevant and testable. The fourth focus area is digital transformation. The bottom line is DOD is not keeping up with industries and adversaries adaptation of digital R&D and T&E capabilities. We need new tools. I already mentioned automated, maybe AI enabled data collection and analysis tools. We also must build easily shared in mind yet cyber secure data repositories. And we need more sophisticated modeling environments to undergo constant refresh and continuous verification, validation and accreditation. And that last part, regular VVNA is key. Testers and warfighters must be able to trust that the MNS are accurate and operationally relevant. The final focus area is workforce expertise and partnerships. T&E of complex technologies requires a lot of deep cutting edge expertise. DOD needs mechanisms both to attract more talent to government service and to obtain consistent on-demand access to experts from academia and industry. DataWorks themes clearly line up well with the ot &E strategic plan. As you dive into the various sessions over the next three days, I ask that you keep dot &E goals in mind. dot &E simply cannot falter in its mission to determine the operational capabilities and credibility of DOD systems and provide that information in a timely fashion to warfighters and decision makers. I'm looking for your thoughts on how to bring our plan to fruition so that we continue to do our job effectively and efficiently. Before I turn it over to the keynote speaker, I want to recognize Muslims who will begin celebrating Ramadan, a month of sacrifice and prayer starting this evening. I hope everyone has a generous Ramadan. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker, Dr. Mary Missy Cummings. I think everyone has a bio, but I'd like to highlight a few things and add my two cents. Dr. Cummings graduated from the Naval Academy where she majored in mathematics. When a combat exclusion policy was dropped, she earned her wings as one of the Navy's first female combat pilots and flew the FNA 18 Hornet. While still in the Navy, she got an MS in Space Systems Engineering at the Naval Postgraduate School. And after leaving active duty, she earned a PhD in Systems Engineering from UVA. She then became a tenured professor at MIT before moving to Duke University, where she is a professor in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department and director of the Humans and Autonomy Lab. Dr. Cummings has been on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and was the subject of an article in The Atlantic Magazine. And we recently spent a few hours together at the Pentagon. I'm going to state the obvious here. She is one of the most entertaining and brilliant people I've met. If her talk today isn't enough for you, I highly recommend you watch a recent National Academies of Sciences workshop in which she participated. NASA is doing a study commissioned by dot and &E of the Defense Department's t and &E ecosystem. That means ranges, infrastructure, tools, processes, and workforce. In January, Dr. Cummings sat on a panel about envisioning the future of ot and &E and her remarks on testing AI and autonomous systems 
were incredibly insightful and frank. The admin staff at here at the excuse me, the admin staff here at DataWorks has the project webpage address for those who are interested. And now over to Dr. Cummings. Thank you, Ray. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I do call myself an edutainer for obvious reasons um, because I try to educate but entertain at the same time. So uh, I am an academic, but as you heard, I was formerly a, a US Navy fighter pilot. And so I think that that gives me a really unique insight because I take this very seriously. And by this, I mean, look, we're developing technologies, uh, nascent technologies coming out of academia, and it's not clear that we understand what the boundary limits are of the capabilities of, this, of these technologies. And so, uh, you know, and I've seen people die, literally die in cockpits um, in my squadron and in nearby squadrons because people introduced technology that really wasn't up to speed. So uh, with that backdrop, then I've really been heavily engaged recently in thinking about how to test and certify artificial intelligence, especially in systems where handovers to humans need to happen because humans can be strong in some areas and weak in others. Uh, and we really need to know what the system requirements and uh, capabilities are to make sure that these systems are safe. So the research that I'm about to show you is paid for by your sister agency down the street, the Department of Transportation. It's no secret that autonomous vehicles are on the horizon. And I think that there's a lot of hype and really not a lot of clarity about the capabilities of these cars. So I'm gonna to talk to you about how we assessed a real world autonomous system that many of you in the audience may have. These are Tesla Model 3s. So before I launch into this, this is actually my most popular presentation I give right now, and it's certainly the most timely. I am not telling you not to buy a, a, a Tesla Model 3. I love Teslas, I love the company. I am telling you that the autopilot system underneath it has some serious limitations, but we really didn't know what those were until we started uh, getting into this research. Now, I assume everybody can see my screen or maybe somebody would have sent me a chat, but you should be seeing a, a screen called the conundrum of partial autonomy. So please let me know if that's not the case. So the conundrum of partial autonomy is, we, we, we engineers love to design systems that maybe can remove the human. Sometimes that's a good idea because we don't want the human to make mistakes. Uh, sometimes it's for economies of scale. You know, if we, if, airlines can get rid of pilots, that is a huge component of their salaries, retirement, you know, they, they could, our, our airline tickets would be so much cheaper if we didn't have to pay for pilots. So, I mean, it's a nice theoretical construct, maybe that we can replace people with automation or autonomous systems, but the reality is, is much more murky and difficult because autonomous systems, especially today, cannot do all things, particularly in complex systems. And so, you know, where to put the human in these partial autonomous systems because humans are still needed for some tasks. So what I mean by that is if you look at this figure on the right, you'll see that there's this, we call it the SRKE curve, the skill, rule, knowledge, and expert-based reasoning. Down here at the lower end of the curve, you need skill-based reasoning to drive a car or fly a plane. You need to learn the skills of how to do that. Rule-based reasoning happens when you learn how to apply the rules in your system. I see a stop sign. I know where I'm supposed to start breaking 30 feet in advance, come to a stop. Um, and then, uh, Sorry, I'm getting your picture there. Um, and then that's low in uncertainty. And this is why you see this curve coming up because the higher that you go on this curve, the more uncertainty there is in the world. And then when we get to knowledge-based reasoning, knowledge-based reasoning occurs when there's judgment under uncertainty. Some entity, a human or autonomous system, has to see as a signals from the world and it's not clear, it's not sure what that signal is. Now I show you a stop sign that's partially occluded and you thinking yourself, oh my God, that's so easy. I know that's a stop sign. I only need to see maybe even just a quarter of the stop sign or even a 10th of a stop sign to know it's a stop sign. Unfortunately, computer vision systems today are not that capable. And indeed in today's world, autonomous vehicles cannot understand that 
a partially occluded stop sign is a stop sign. I mean, they might be able to if they had a million training images shown to them in a convolutional neural network training, but if they didn't, they don't know. And so this is actually part of the problem is this autonomous systems reasoning is extremely brittle. If, it, if the situation wasn't represented in the underlying data training set, then it's not gonna be able to reason, the car won't be able to reason in the real world. And that is true for every single autonomous system that relies on computer vision systems. We're gonna talk mostly about cars today, but occasionally I will bring back in and say, look, this is exactly applicable to military systems as well. You see a lot of computer vision systems, especially for automated target recognition, something that was very near and dear to my heart as a pilot. And you know, if we can't figure out that a partially occluded stop sign is a stop sign, we're gonna have a lot harder time with other more complex fog of war scenarios in the military. And if we can't get knowledge-based reasoning figured out, then we can't eventually achieve what we call expert-based reasoning. And that is dealing with maximum uncertainty. In aviation, I like to bring up the Chesley Sullenberger miracle on a Hudson. Maximum uncertainty, loss of two engines, not clear if you're gonna be able to make the runway. We needed a human to do that. We would need a human in this scenario, I show you uh, that um, if you're at the stop sign, and you see these four different turning errors, what do you do? I mean, first of all, you had to break the rules to get there, which happens quite a bit with humans, but humans actually can understand how to break the rules to potentially safely get out of the situation. So if the autonomy is not quite right, if it, if it can't get past that stop sign, it's never gonna get to the, to the arena where we need it to do expert-based reasoning. So then the question is, where are we on that scale? How do we assess that? How do we test to see if the systems are good enough? So that's the other thing I want people to understand. I'm not advocating for 100% autonomy. We'll never get it. It just can't possible. It's not possible. But there are levels of a threshold of good enough. If we could, for example, get autonomous cars to be as good or at least even 10% better than drivers, maybe that would be the threshold that we should need to make to get these systems deployed in the world. Now, in this driving scenario, uh, cars today that are publicly available to you, the most advanced car that you can get comes with something we call a level two plus system. That's where autonomy gets into the hands of your everyday person. Uh, and it's really level two plus in systems like Tesla's. And there are other systems, Ford F-150s. I can't wait to start testing a Ford F-150. Uh, these are systems that have automated cruise control, autonomous cruise control, right? So they've got some active radar controlling the distance between you and the car in front of it, but they've also got some lateral steering um, and you know they can pass and change lanes and do navigation tasks. And so these nav tasks are definitely at this rule-based level. So these L2 cars have a lot of autonomy, more than we've ever actually seen in an everyday system. Uh, however, they're still driver assist. And it's very clear, Tesla makes that very clear in all their documents. These are just assist cars, you have to maintain, you have to put your hands on the wheel, you have to be in control. And the reason indeed that they're still L2 plus cars is because of this computer vision problem that I've highlighted here. I, it is my personal opinion that John Krafik, the CEO of Waymo, just quit because he knew that this problem is not solvable. And I will drop into the link, uh, uh, to the chat link, a paper that really goes into more detail about this. Uh, I'm not sure it's ever going to be solvable, so uh, we can come back to that later. Okay, so that's the backdrop of thinking about, well, how do we know where, how much autonomy is in the car and whether or not we should be handing off the autonomy? Because the, what we do is when we put partial autonomy in a system, we actually break that curve into two. We say, okay, autonomy, you're going to handle the lower end of the curve. You do good at that. You do good at navigation. I'm going to get, let you control the car and do the nav. And for the humans, we're going to have you just babysit for all of those times that we're going to need this out of the box thinking, the judgment under uncertainty. And so if we do this mutually exclusive break of a curve, and, and by the way, this is the most popular way that autonomous systems are built today, that there's two different mutually exclusive areas. Uh, well, this, this is a problem in this particular domain. It's actually not a bad idea in aviation, uh, but unfortunately in driving, this is difficult because we know that humans are get complacent, bored, and they don't pay attention. They get distracted very easily. And if the autonomy is pretty good, it kind of lulls people into a false sense of security. So if we know we have these problems, 
and we know that humans need to be able to jump into the loop at any time, oh, oh, you know, we could see that there might be some problems. And indeed, this is where both in developmental and operational testing, you would want to get somebody in to start evaluating these scenarios. Unfortunately, we're doing this evaluation after the car has been widely deployed. So um, I don't recommend uh, deploying a system before you test it. Okay, so we are about to go on Mr. Toad's wild ride through these tests. I'm gonna go pretty fast. The, the full version of this brief takes twice as long. So we're gonna go pretty quickly and I'll leave some more links to other papers uh, about the, the details about these tests. But basically we constructed four tests that were increasing in complexity on this X axis. So, and by complexity, we mean the difficulty for the computer vision perception systems, because there's not just vision, there's radar in there too. Uh, the difficulty of the system in executing this task, and then the ability of the car to be able to actually execute that task. So we're going to talk about a highway lane departure construction curve task. Now, what we weren't sure is there's this third measure that we're looking at is driver alerting. And in every single one of these scenarios, we are testing with the assumption that the driver has been 100% distracted. Either the person fell asleep or they're playing video games, which has been um, a big problem with Teslas. People are climbing in the back seat to go to sleep. Also a real world problem with Teslas. So uh, we did all of these, oh, well, three, of, three of the four of the tests happen at the North Carolina Center for Automotive Research track. It's a NASCAR track. It's a great thing about being in North Carolina is NASCAR. So we have access to a fantastic track and we're gonna show some pictures of that. Uh, I told you three Model 3s, 10 randomized runs each, one driver, one assistant. Um, and we did these within, these were about a year ago that we did these tests in a six hour window. We had to keep that pretty consistent because of sun angle. Even at that, we're gonna talk about sun angle. So again, the real question is what we're happening is if we break this curve, which is what is happening inside of a Tesla, then is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Should we have better alerting systems? You know, so all of these tests are actually gonna show you what specific aspect of the system needs to be fixed. All right, so the first test was the curve test. So this is actually the track that we have at NCAR. So how this test started is we had the car accelerate to 35 miles an hour, put it into autopilot. It has lane markings that it can track on and then once it hit this blue line, it lost its lane markings. We, we just dropped the lane markings. This is a big problem in Tesla's. It heavily leverages the lane markings to actually know where it is in the world. And if you remove the lane marking, and remember, we're assuming that the driver is not paying attention at all. So we're assuming it, although what that means is the driver did not have his hand on the steering wheel. So that's how Tesla knows knows that the driver is or is not paying attention, that the, the person's hands are on the steering wheels. So the my Confederate driver, hands not on the steering wheel, he is paying attention and we do have somebody else in the car for obvious reasons, for safety reasons, but he's acting as if he was totally distracted. So then um, what we were wanting to see is what was happening with the alerting system and could the car safely stop itself? if the driver never touched the steering wheel. So after 30 trials, 10 runs each randomized with, across the three um, uh, uh, cars. What we see is three strange, I mean, this, is, this was strange to us, three clusters of um, beginnings of alerts. So what I mean is Tesla is gonna go through a three alert sequence. When it, tell, when it thinks your hand should be on the steering wheel, it's gonna tell you, put your hands on the steering wheel. It's a visual message. If you don't do it after a period of time, it's gonna tell you again, seriously, put your hands on the steering wheel. These are all visual. Occasionally, occasionally an audio alert will sound, but not always. If on the third alert, you do not put your hands on the steering wheel, the car will stop itself, put the blinkers, the flashers on, and then, you're, it's just the car's stopped. You have to get out of the car to get back in to restart it. So what we saw in this test was after the loss of lane marking, only five out of the 30 trials actually gave the first alert in the place that Tesla says it should give you the alert. 
So what that means is only five, and this was only car two, only car two gave the alert, that first alert, a few seconds right after your hands came off the wheel and it lost its lane marking. Then what happened was there was a big cluster of zone two, and by zone two, we mean that was the time that the cars got the first alert. Then a bunch of car one and car three um, trials gave you the first alert in zone two. And then a quarter of a mile later, a quarter of a mile later, was the first time this cluster of cars. Now, what's unique about this test is, first of all, that there's clear clusters. I mean, uh, we did the um, K means clustering on this. I know there's some statisticians out there, so you know I'm brethren with you, except that, I mean, this is clear. There, there is very little overlap in these, uh, if at all, distributions. So uh, then, so what's happening? So why is it that five out of the trials and then um, uh, then there were 30% of the trials, cars went 26 seconds was a quarter of a mile. I mean, this is huge variation. And by the way, for the same car, so half of car two did it right away. And then the other half of car two's trials did it at a quarter of a mile down the road. These are extremely inconsistent results. And and suggestively dangerous. Although I will say, I should have highlighted this first, autopilot safely stopped the car in all 30 trials. So the driver never had to take over in all 30 trials, which actually I was surprised about. I thought that the car would not be able to handle it because these are very aggressive curves, 120 here, 120 degrees, 190 degrees here. So, and I rode in this in the backseat, very disconcerting to let an autopilot drive you through a pretty aggressive track. So it did a great job of assessing that the driver was not paying attention and stopping, but it was extremely inconsistent about when it was doing so. And if there had been any other cars or potentially any other problems on the road, you could see why uh, this would be a problem if drivers are not paying attention because you know, a lot, a lot of bad things can happen in 26 seconds uh, at 35 miles, even, even at a slow speed. So uh, this was, what did we learn from this? We learned that the computer vision system is very inconsistent. It does not use the same whatever, what, and we don't know how it's making its decisions because that's part of the problem with these underlying neural networks are, we don't know how the car's making the decisions, so we don't know what's causing the problem. But there's clearly three different areas that the car is picking up on something. Again, we don't know what that something is. We actually then went back and looked at sun angle. We did some mathematical um, computations, statistical cor correlations. There is a significant but weak correlation uh, with sun angle here. So it, it could be poss it's possible that the sun angle, the way it moves through the day, could potentially make different features in the environment more salient that the vision system would pick up on. Again, because it's the neural net, we don't really know what those features would be, but we can tell that whatever is happening, that there were three different clusters of that first initial alert. And 30% um, and of the cars would have gone a significant distance without a driver uh, being notified and, and or being able to take over. So, you know, I would say this test was kind of a mixed bag. There are some good things. The autopilot was able to stop the car like it said it was going to, but the alerting of the driver was pretty bad. Okay, test two, same three Teslas. Uh, we, there was one of the cars, and this is gonna be important later. You need to know that even though they're all three Model 3s, first of all, they all had three different software packages. Even though they have over the air updates, it doesn't, it, they're not updated at the same rate. And so I think this is gonna be a problem for autonomous systems going forward. Uh, and car two had full self-driving, which is Elon Musk just recently admitted is not actually real full self-driving. Uh, but we had to disable the visualization on that because why it matters is because in theory, full self-driving gives you uh, some information on the screen about potential obstacles. And we didn't want our own driver to be able to see this. So same times of day, same 10 runs each. This time we did it at 25 miles an hour on the track. So what happened was we would start the car, accelerate at 25 miles an hour, put it on autopilot, and then have it track in between. Um, and these, these are white lines like you're on a highway or, or some kind of um, divided highway. And then there's a set of orange construction cones here. And so 
autonomous vehicles in general, but especially Teslas have been criticized for their inability to handle construction zones. Now we actually gave the system a bit of a crutch um, both because we do this in North Carolina and also for safety. We actually painted a diagonal yellow line. So um, it's a whole nother discussion about how different states approach uh, autonomous vehicles. So in North Carolina, we literally provide these kinds of assist lines to autonomous vehicles to help them know that there's a potential obstacle coming up. So uh, we, uh, person's hands were not on the steering wheel at this point and the car drove straight at the cones. And so what the car should have done is either guided on the yellow line or detected the cones and then gone around. And then if the car was successful in autopilot with no human at the wheel, it would have done all of this on its own. Uh, and so let me show you what happened with the results. So uh, car two, would have killed the driver all 10 times. So out of its 10 trials, car two would have run full speed into the cones regardless of what was painted on the lines. And so, I mean, this is, it's full self-driving. It in theory was the most capable Tesla, but this one Tesla was clearly the most dangerous Tesla. So car two failed all the time. Car one and car three were, did successfully guide around uh, the cones. Uh, so that's good, at least you know, two thirds of the time uh, and 100% of the time for those two cars if they did not have full, full self-driving, the car guided like it was supposed to. But what about alerting the human? And this is actually where we see a huge difference. So um, six out of the 10 trials, the car, car one provided the driver an alert. And indeed, 100% of the time per Tesla's owner's manual, it should have alerted the driver every single time because it was entering a, an unsafe zone. Construction zones have a lot of vulnerable users, workers, um, police sometimes. And so uh, they, the humans should be taking over, but remember our human was refusing to take over. And uh, in the car too, even though it would have killed the driver all 10 times, Three out of the 10 times it would have let the driver know it was about he, he or she was about to die. And car three was a little bit better at seven out of 10 times, but still um, very, very inconsistent. Now, what about where the alerts happened? So what you'll see here is car one and car two had, you know, the earliest alerts. Car three, even though um, it had the highest percentage, its alerts were later. So what, what does this tell you? Well, first of all, it tells you that the full self-driving package don't use it for full self-driving. Secondly, the alerts are extremely inconsistent, right? Again, they're inconsistent in where they're happening, both within a car and across cars, right? I think that's the hard thing for people to understand is these are all Model 3 Teslas from 2018. And so we're seeing dramatically different performance between where they alert, if they alert. And you can imagine um, if a person is not paying attention, then it's pretty easy to get this car into a bad situation. And indeed, in just the past month, we've seen two people drive uh, in autopilot under semis, T-bone a semi. And, you know, I think everybody survived in the last month. But other people who have done that have not survived in the past. Uh, in the past, so you know there are some serious consequences to not paying attention. All right, the emergency road departure test. Uh, this is the test that um, I thought my student he was going to quit after this test. Uh, so Tesla says they advertise that if you start to drift off the road, regardless of whether you're an autopilot, uh, that the car will do emergency steering assist to get you back on. So this is like a car is going to basically be your guardian angel and get you back on the road if you start to drift off because you're texting or falling asleep, right? So the capability, if it worked, would be amazing. Uh, so we wanted to test whether or not this was true. So in this test, what we did is we accelerated to 35 miles an hour, put the car on autopilot, drivers not in theory paying attention, and then at a certain distance here at this cone, the car would put a five, to, the student would put a five degree nudge, nudge. So the steering wheel will go five degrees and the car would slowly start to drift at 35 miles an hour off the side. Uh, and um, we had all sorts of camera sensors. And again, I'll provide you all the details you want to, um, if you want to know exactly how we did this. 
Now, um, these results were very illustrative in terms of both the variability of the systems and how potentially dangerous this is. So 50% of the drivers um, uh, would have, 50% of the trials would have ended with the distracted driver off the road. And by that, uh, we mean uh, that there was no alert and no emergency assist. Indeed, only 21% uh, of all the trials had the steering, right? So only one out of five times would the autonomy have actually done what it is advertised to do on brilliantly bright blue sunny days, not, you know, not a cloud in the sky. So these are perfect test days under the perfect capabilities that the car should be able to perform in. And indeed what you're seeing in this graph down here are uh, these are the numbers for each car. Either there was no alarm, uh, there was an alarm but no assist, or there was an alarm and an assist. And this is actually where these numbers come from. So 50% so of the time, the car would have gone off the road with no alarm and no emergency assist. Indeed, we and, and we didn't even use autopilot, by the way. This test happened and we just used automated cruise control to keep the car tracking straight. So uh, it's actually not surprising when we start to see all these crashes where Teslas go off the road and the driver will say, I didn't, I didn't even, I thought, I thought the car had control. Well, that's because the car was doing a pretty good job, but then all of a sudden the car quit for whatever reason. And indeed, this is again with these computer vision systems, we just don't know why they did what they did and that, that presents difficulties. So the last test, highway driver monitoring. <clears throat> so the car, it's sweet spot. Even though you're not supposed to be using autopilot on divided roads, rural roads, and you're, but you can, you're not supposed to. The sweet spot for the Tesla uh, uh, autopilot is highway driving. So we got a highway track, we found a highway track. This is a five mile track between these two exits. and. We would get on the highway, set autopilot, hands off, completely acting like a distracted driver and see how far we could go um, before the, um, it's called the autopilot nag, that's what the people on the Tesla um, uh, blogs like to call it, would jump in and say to you, put your hands on the steering wheel. So we wanted to test two things. How repeatable was this? How reliable was the hands on the steering wheel? And how long did it take people to clear? Once you put your hands on the steering wheel, how long does it take them to clear it? Because it could be that if it takes a long time or people are really struggling with it, this could be another source of distraction. So um, we ended up with 162 events. Again, we did 10 times per car, um, 10, 10 tests per car. So we had a problem with the full self-driving car. This, the, after this, this test, my student was like, that's it. I, I, I think he was very pro Tesla's before this test started. I mean, and who wouldn't want to spend their whole um, month of March driving a Tesla? But uh, after this, he's like, I'm not buying it. Because what car two would do is car two, you would put your hands on, the, or you would take your hands off. And then car two just started doing literally something wild. It would start driving off the interstate and he would have to stop the test. So this is actually why you see so few events from car two because car two was on its own program. It was like Christine, that Stephen King movie. So um, we saw a lot less participation. So most of these results are gonna come from cars one and three. So there were three outcomes from these cars. You would take your hands off, drive, the car would alert you, and then you would put your hands on and touch it, and then autopilot would, would keep going. It would, it would, the alarm would clear, but the car is still driving itself. That's what it's supposed to do. So you take your hands off, you put your hand, you touch it, just in, or you know, you actually have to provide a little counter torque in some way, but autopilot stays on and that's the expectation and that's what the owner's manual would tell you what to do. So that would be considered a success. A failure would be that the person uh, put their hands on the, uh, well, that they never got the alert in the first place. Then there's the shutoff, which is a little tricky. So this is where the car would you would put your hands on the steering wheel, give a little counter torque like you're supposed to, and then the alarm would clear, but then autopilot would shut off, but it wouldn't tell you it's shutting off. It would just kind of, it, there, was, there was a light that would go out, but it wouldn't provide you an audio signal that you were supposed to. And this is extremely sneaky 
because most of the, uh, for the far vast majority of the events, and when you're doing this, the autopilot stays on and people are actually hab habituated to think it is gonna stay on. And indeed, that's what we found is that 3.6% of the successful trials where the alarm would clear ended in the autopilot unexpectedly turning off. And this is huge because this is mode confusion. And indeed, this will lead people to think if 94% if of the, or 96% of the time you actually put your hands on the wheel and autopilot stays on. And so you're habituated to that. And that 4% chance that it actually doesn't do it, then you can imagine that drivers do not appreciate that the autopilot turned off unexpectedly. And they're thinking the car is still in control when it's not in control. And indeed, this has led to a lot of accidents. Now, I will say to, in defense of Tesla, their, their, their alerting was consistent. It was roughly every 30 seconds. Sometimes it would go as far as 45 seconds, 44 seconds um, at lower speeds. Um, but for the most part, it was consistent. And it was also pretty consistent in terms of the time to clear each alert. So that was good, but this sneaky problem of automation failing, autonomy failing for no reason that's obvious to you and no clear alert back to the human, this is bad. We've seen this many times in aviation. I mean, the aviation world is replete with examples of how uh, autonomy can kill you because you don't understand which mode it was in. All right, quick summary of all of this. And what does it mean for driving? What does it mean for autonomous system testing? So I think from a testing perspective, one of the things that you that I hope you can appreciate from this graph. So this is that graph I showed you before, and this these were the, how the actual results um, stacked out. So lots of dangerous alerting across um, many tests. Sometimes the highway cars one and three performed. Oops, sorry about that. Cars three performed really well at uh, in the highway test, except that there was this questionable autopilot unexpected shutoff. So even though it performed well in that one scenario, it is kind of marginal because people may not appreciate that the autopilot turned off unexpectedly. I would say that there was unexpected good performance in the curve test in the in autopilot's ability to handle such a demanding environment. And one of these, that, that result suggests to me that the engineers at Tesla may be focused more on what they perceive in their mind to be the extreme events as, to pose, as opposed to what are the real extreme events from the perspective of autonomy. It turns out that that emergency lane assist is, that, that system is terrible. It doesn't work. It should not, people should not be allowed to use it. I think it's unsafe. But you would think that's pretty easy. I mean, parallel, white lines, vanishing line, you know, I mean, there's some computer vision you would think that um, this is easy to do. Why are we having problems? Well, we are having problems and we don't know why the, the system is not able to do it. We checked for sun angle. We couldn't, that didn't seem to be an issue. There is something going on in the way that the car, the computer vision system tracks that line, the edge of the road or not. And if we can't figure out what the problem is, then that begs the question, should these systems be allowed to do what they're doing if you can't reverse engineer why failures are happening? And indeed, you know, I would say the big, the big walk away from this whole test scenario is, look, there's significant variability in this system's performance that we did not anticipate. There's variability in the car's ability to control itself. There's variability in the way that it's alerting and interacting with the human. And that's bad because cars need to be, if nothing else, consistent in the way they're presenting information to a human. And so if we've got such dramatic variability, it suggests to me that Number one, developmental testing didn't happen in the way it should have happened um, or it would have caught some of these things. And clearly, and there is no such thing as operational testing uh, that's mandated, certainly at a right the federal level in cars, but certainly, and, you know, Tesla is also, either they are doing these tests and they don't care what the outcomes are, or I suspect they're just really busy trying to get to sell cars and build them, that they're not taking the time and the effort to do the kind of tests. And by the way, these tests that we did on this car is the first time that any kinds of these tests have ever been done in a public setting. So, uh, you know, I, I would hope that the test community who's listening to this call would say, okay, yes, we need to do more of this. We need to do what I would consider to be, you know, real world testing to try to target 
what are the failure modes of the autonomy elements? And I, there's a big argument going on in the operational test world right now. And sometimes I jump into that argument about simulation, what is simulation good for? Um, I, I, it's my belief that simulation is only good for autonomous systems in developmental stages, not at all good for operational stages. We could argue about that later. Uh, I would, I do want to highlight one more element of this, um, of this, the outcomes of these tests. You know, you, you've seen the results, you've seen how widely variable are, I'm not going to beat that um, uh, horse, but I do want to say that it is, it looks to us like there are so many problems with these systems that uh, it looks like the public is being used for what we call beta testing, like that full self-driving car, dangerous, should not at all, the car itself should not have the control system to have, it should not be in the hands of somebody in the public, just your average person in the public. And, and that's how we got these three cars, by the way, we just rented them through Turo uh, from your average Joe or Jane in the public. So it suggests that perhaps cars are being, um, people are being used for beta testing, meaning they, they are trying to figure out what the problems are. And this has become clear that Tesla has a camera that faces the driver that they don't use for everyday driver alerting, but they use to send information back to Tesla. So Tesla is doing some design and testing, but they're using people on the public roads to do that. And I think that this kind of suggests that, ooh, you know, we've got a problem here. And while that may not be a problem that the military has directly that you're not going to go test weapon systems, you're not going to have the public test your weapon systems, I would say that it does suggest that if you do work with contractors or people who are developing these systems for you, you know, it's not, you need to be you need to make sure that that how they're doing their testing is more transparent to you and that you know what are the right questions to ask in terms of how did you get that data? Why are you, where are you getting that data? What's the quality of that data? And how can you demonstrate to me that not only are your test results legit, but the way you got the data to do the test results is legit. Okay, with that, I think we have about five minutes for questions. So I'll end it there. I, I see that there are some. Yeah, Q. thank you. Thank you for that excellent keynote, Dr. Cummings. I can help you moderate questions um, and allow folks who ask the question in the chat to actually speak up if they have a microphone and would like to. So I saw Mark Herrera's first. Mark, I think I have given you permission to, to speak if you want to unmute and ask your question. Um, hi, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, thank you. I appreciated your talk. And I think you've alluded to this already, but um, I was wondering, have you had the opportunity to collaborate with Tesla or their engineers or their SMEs on how the revision works or how their autopilot stuff works in terms of the gradients, quality of training set, yada, yada, yada. Um, because, yeah. you know, as part of the OT community, the black box thing is something that we will continue to suffer with and struggle with. And I don't know if it's different in academia or if they're more willing to work with you there, but um, yeah, it's, it's kicking our butt. Yeah, well, that's a great question. Uh, so I, again, you know, the message is I love Tesla. I love Tesla so much. I've actually been to Tesla and I have talked with their engineers and Tesla uh, has hired a lot of my former, many of my former students. So, uh, I, you know, of course you can imagine Tesla's probably not thrilled with these results. They do have them, by the way, we sent them all this data. Um, they've been very, it's a kind of a one way there, but they are an absorbing Markov chain. We give everything to them and they don't really talk to us uh, to give us any data back. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I appreciate that they do not want, you know, that I'm just a gnat that's bothering them. So they don't feel like they have to, to deal with me. But uh, I do know that other people are listening, by the way. So the United Kingdom has taken these results and they're using them to inform some new uh, policy in terms of what they're going to do about what is going to be allowed uh, in terms of public access for autopilot and some other issues there. So these, um, these results, I think, are they are communicating a lot of important information to if Tesla doesn't want to listen, other people are listening. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety also really loves these results. So it turns out in the world of driving your um, your insurance, who sets your insurance rates, the IHS has a lot more power. Um, they really kind of a shadow regulatory agency. Uh, 
So I, I wish that we had a better collaboration with Tesla, but Tesla is going to be like every other big company, Facebook, Amazon, you know, everybody in the fan group, they're not going to, they're not going to reveal what's going on because they don't want to open themselves up to the litigation. But I think that this is where the border between who is a, um, uh, who is developing the software for the general public, that may be one thing, but what gets into military code, I think for companies like Google that are starting to do a lot more military work on top of doing their civilian work, I can promise you they're gonna leverage that same code. So I do think it's an important lesson uh, to understand about how to work with these agencies or companies and, and what they will or will not tell you. And oh, somebody asked, do I have a Tesla? No, I would, I would take one if somebody um, gave me one, but uh, I'm not, definitely not gonna spend that money. Jason Matashek, I see your question and I just asked you to unmute if you let us speak up. Okay. Um, I was, uh, I guess, surprised at your comment that um, you think machine vision, uh, autonomy using machine vision may not be possible. I mean, I wonder what, why, that, why people think that, given that nature can do it with even relatively small uh, neural networks. I think that's a great question. I think that, that the answer to that, um, I will send out a paper and because uh, there's a much more detailed answer to that. But the reality is that the neural networks that nature uses are far, far, far more complex than the representations that we're using, which are actually not that complex, it's certainly not compared to what nature is. I'm not saying it's never going to be possible, but the way that we design machine learning enabled technologies, and I've got other papers on this, it turns out that it's actually incredibly subjective to design and build a convolutional neural net. It is subjective from the way that you select the data, the way that you select the hyperparameters, the way that you, you elect what features you want to include or not include in a model. And these are tr these tremendous sources of subjectivity are hidden uh, and you as the consumer of a technology, I mean, it's it's fine that they're hidden for your Netflix, what's the next movie you should select algorithm. Uh, those, if, if, the, if the predictions are wrong, then no big deal, right? You just watch a bad movie. But this is why we have such a problem with automated target recognition, because there are so many problems that are just inherent in, you know, machine learning is not an objective quantitative mathematical representation. It's not, it's incredibly subjective. And until we both accept that and then start to figure out how to deal with the uncertainty that that, that inserts into the systems, then we're, we're not gonna get a automated target recognition system that's gonna work, we're just not. So I think that we, we need to figure out both in the military and also in the commercial world, we've gotta recognize that the way that we're doing this now is not going to work in the short term, we need some kind of paradigm shift. And, you know, of course I'm gonna say this as a researcher, oh, you should pay us more to do more research. That is true. Um, but I also believe that a lot more research dollars should be spent towards testing and evaluation. And I know probably everybody in the audience is like, yes, yes, yes. But it is desperately an area that needs more work. There, people do not know how to assess machine learning algorithms for anything really, uh, but we especially need to be able to do this for safety critical systems. All right, I think we have time for one more. Um, so I saw Craig Andres had a question in the chat. I just asked you to unmute if you would like to ask your question, Craig. If he's not able to, he's wondering how long ago these tests were done. He's had a Model 3 for over a year and it's improved a lot in just that time. So could you speak to that? Yeah, so these tests were done a year ago and indeed we're in the second round of uh, we're getting ready to do a new round of similar tests. They're not exactly the same. Um, we're actually going to start testing the, the systems under low sun angle conditions. We're going to try to start addressing some of these sun angle concerns. And we're also going to start addressing um, pedestrian detection uh, for these systems. And enough systems, the reason we could only test Teslas last year is because that was really the only car that we could get our hands on that had the L2 plus capability 
Um, you know, there's just not that many out there, but this year there's more cars with those kinds of technologies. So we're looking at cars like Cadillac Super Cruise, for example, um, a Hyundai, a Sonata that has some similar technologies. And so uh, I, and I open it up to this test community. Um, you know, this is being paid for by US government, federal government dollars. If you would like to come down to North Carolina over the summer and see how these tests are being conducted and, you know, just kind of hang out and see how the magic happens, we'd love to host you.